Thank you, everyone, for being here this morning. We appreciate you. hope that you're doing well. As we mentioned earlier, we are continuing our study uh, that we had started last week in John chapter 10. We are looking at the words of Jesus in this passage, and we are saying uh, we are seeing if uh, what he advocated there was indeed what is attributed to this, and that is that Jesus was trying to teach, once you're saved, you're always saved. Of course, that is not what he was going to teach, but what I would like to do is I would like to introduce us with some thoughts pertaining to the security that we do have in Jesus, but the security is, of course, conditional. We know that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then, uh, then to these things? If God be for us, who could be against us? Uh, God, who spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, who is risen from the dead, who is on the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Listen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 8, 28 through 39. Now I want you to turn your attention back in this passage that I just quoted. And I want you to, to turn your attention to verse number 29. Where he says in verse 28, All things work together for good to them who love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. Now we see a condition already established in the very first verse we referenced. To those who love God. 1 John 2 verses 3 through 6 indicate that those who love God are those who obey God. But verse number uh, 28 where he says all things work together for good to them who love God. To them who are called according to his purpose. Verse 29 says for whom he did foreknow he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. There's another condition established. Those that would conform themselves to the image of Christ are those that love God. Verse 28. Those that conform themselves to the image of Christ. Romans 8 29 are those who have the blessedness that is established in the, in the verses that follow. When we ask the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The question is obvious. Nothing but yourself. For loving God, verse 29. For conforming self to image of Christ, verse 29. Uh, uh, verse 29 loving God, verse 28, are conditional statements. So as we are looking at this uh, passage of Scripture in John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, <clears throat> we are asking ourselves... Is Jesus establishing a principle that says, once we are in the fold, we can never leave. Once we are part of his sheep, we can never go astray. Is that what Jesus is really saying? Well, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about false doctrines and error. And we, we, we rightly correct the concept of once saved, always saved. Now, <clears throat> there is a sense in which once you're saved, you should never be lost. That's true. Once you are saved, you should never perish. Certainly that's true. But it doesn't mean that you can't perish. That's the argument that we make. <clears throat> and it's really not all that fine of a point. Because you see absurdities coming out of the doctrine of what saved always saved. You have individuals, I've, I've heard in a, uh, in a debate uh, that was a few years back, a, a Baptist preacher, he had said, the, he was asked a question, and the question was, um, is it true that you could come to my house and rob me and kill me and my family in our sleep and you would still be saved if you were part of the elect? And he answered, yes. Do you understand the kind of damage this does to a person's psyche? In other words, I can do whatever I want to if I'm part of the elect. I can do whatever I want to and I'll never lose my salvation. That is extremely dangerous, not to mention absurd. 
Of course you can lose your salvation. The very concept of conditional salvation permeates the entire Bible, not only the New Testament. And we're going to look at some of that today. I want to recap quickly <clears throat> what we looked at last week. And I want to apologize also for last week because, again, I was looking at some of the tenses of the word. And I think that as I went fairly quickly through them, that I, I may have not been very clear in what I was trying to do. I want to try to clear that up quickly uh, uh, today. First, we need to establish... That last week we looked at John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, in light of verse 27. Right? We looked at it in light of Jesus saying that uh, these individuals who would be his sheep, they hear his voice, and he knows them, and they follow him. Now, what we looked at is we looked at the, the Greek language, and we showed you that the word they hear, hear is present tense. That Jesus knows them, know is present tense. And they follow him. Follow is also present tense. So Jesus knows currently those that presently hear and follow. Right? That is to say, well, they've heard my voice once. And because of that, they're always following me and I always know them. Even when they're not actually following me. Right? I've, I've actually heard somebody say that a Christian is a Christian no matter if they've fallen away or not. That's not true. A Christian is a descriptive term. Christian means follower of Jesus. If in Acts 11 and verse 26 they were first called Christians in Antioch, and those that were called Christian were disciples, and Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says that the disciple is an individual who hears God's voice and does what he tells him, then a Christian is very descriptive in its terminology, is it not? That is a Christ-like person, one who follows him. You can't follow Jesus and also not follow Jesus. Now I know that I'm splitting hairs and I'm using uh, what, some would, what some would argue is simply a matter of semantics. And that may be true, but guess what? Words mean things. So yes, you, if you're a Christian, you're following Jesus. There's no such thing as an unfaithful Christian. That's, that's, uh, that, that's, kind, of a, uh, 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 that's kind of redundant. You know, uh, to say a faithful Christian is redundancy. To say an unfaithful Christian is oxymoronic. It can't be. They're mutually exclusive. So I just think we need to be careful how we use words. So all I'm establishing in John 10 is that there are some words used in the present tense which emphasize that they keep on doing these things in order to receive the blessings. Not they've done it once and forever they're blessed. And so that took us into various other passages. <clears throat> we spent some time in, in uh, John chapter 3 and verse 16. Uh, we, we emphasize that those are uh, individuals who believeth, they keep on believing in Jesus, are those that have access to eternal life. We went to 1 John chapter 1. We went to 1 John chapter uh, 2, and we spent some time in chapter 3. And all we were doing was looking at these verses and showing you the present tense words. Showing you that it's emphasizing that in order to receive the blessings of the verse, you have to keep on doing those things, right? So that's all I was trying to articulate. For instance, on the screen, you can see in 1 John 1 and verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The words have, deceive, and is are all present tense. Thus, if we say that we currently have no sin, that is, we do not ever fail, we deceive ourselves presently, and the truth is not in us. Deceiving presently and is is also present. That is, the truth is currently not in us. Do you see that it, all these things are contingent upon our action? Our action whether to continual obedience or to continual disobedience, Romans 6 and verse 16. That's all the point that we were trying to make, 1 John 1. Verse 9, confess is present tense. That is, as long as we keep on confessing our sins, we keep on being cleansed from unrighteousness. <clears throat> we mentioned 1 John chapter 3 and verses 3, 4, and 5. And I will just very quickly go through these. You have your outline, and I don't want to spend too much time on here, and I, and I don't want to, uh, <clears throat> to tarry too long here. Uh, because I don't want to take away from the arguments we're going to make uh, a little bit further on in this lesson. First John 1, And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Hath, purified, and is, or present tense. Every man that hath currently this hope currently purifies himself. Right? That's the concept. Verse 4, Whosoever commits sin, committeth. That is a present tense word. You keep on committing sin. In other words, whosoever keeps on committing sin transgresses the law. Right? Yes, because you're continuing in sin. Verse 5. And we know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him, in him, is currently no sin. Verse 6. Whosoever abideth. Anytime you see that word E-T-H in the King James on a verb, you know what it means, right? Keeps on. Keeps on abiding. Abideth, sinneth, sinneth. We have three words in this, uh, in this uh, three verbs in this verse. And all three of these verbs 
abideth, sinneth, and then sinneth again. They're all in that present tense. And the King James uses that old English to emphasize it. Verse 7, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness. There's that word doeth, right? You keep on doing right. Guess what happens if you keep on doing right? Well, you're right. Look at verse 8. He that committeth sin, that is, he keeps on committing sin, is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Verse 8, committeth and is, that is of the devil, are presently. That is, as long as you keep on committing sin, you keep on being of the devil. Do you see how 1 John 1, 8 doesn't mean that a Christian can't ever sin? It means that you can't be a Christian and also remain in sin, right? That's what verse 9 will say. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. The word doth remaineth and cannot are present tense in verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. That is, you currently do not practice sin. Why? Well, because his seed remaineth. That is, the truth is in you and you are following it. Verse 10, in this the children of God are manifest in the children of the devil because whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Our doeth is and he that loveth are all present tense. All I'm trying to emphasize is sometimes when we read a passage, just be careful and ask yourself the question that we always ask. Who's it talking to? When? What are the circumstances behind it, right? What's going on in the context? And then when we read a verse like this, when we use a good version like the King James or the American Standard, even though sometimes it'll have some of those old English words, some of the new translations may not convey that quite as well to us. It may not be as easy to pick out, oh, this is a present tense verb. This means I, I must keep doing this if I... If I want to obtain the promise, right? Or, uh, for instance, Matthew 19, 9, Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another, that is, except for the cause of fornication, committeth adultery. That word committeth means what? Keep on committing as long as you're in that relationship. All right, we get it. Now, I want you to turn to Hebrews 3, and I want to look at some plain teaching to the contrary of the principle, the fallacious principle of once saved, always saved. In Hebrews chapter 3, I think that the Hebrews writer here makes one of the most emphatic declarations against this doctrine that has ever been articulated in Scripture. If you remember in Hebrews chapter 3, because of the previous two chapters, the argument that the Hebrews writer makes is, this is a consequence of disobeying Moses, the inferior lawgiver. Remember in Hebrews 1, Jesus is superior to creation angels and to all the prophets before Hebrews 2, the reason why he is superior is because of his role as a man, his role as redeemer. <clears throat> and Hebrews 3 shows you the consequence of disobeying Moses, who was inferior to Christ. Thus, the implication is how much greater punishment to those who disobey Jesus, right? But look at the argument made in Hebrews 3, beginning in verse number 7. <coughs> Wherefore, the Holy Ghost saith, today if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. In the day in the temptation in the wilderness when your fathers uh, tempted me and proved me and saw my works for 40 years. Wherefore I was grieved of that generation and said they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. Now let's stop there for just a second. <clears throat> Who's he talking about? In Hebrews chapter 7, verse, or Hebrews 3, verses 7 through 11, you could go back and you could see in Numbers chapter 14 the result of those that spied out the land of Canaan. And remember, they went for 40 days. And 10 of the 12 tribes brought back a report that was unfaithful, while, Nathan, uh, while Caleb, excuse me, and Joshua brought back a faithful report. And he said, for every day that you were gone, you're going to wander a year in the wilderness. Forty days equals forty years. And they would wander in the wilderness for forty years. So that was the day of provocation that the, that the Holy Ghost speaks of here in Hebrews chapter 3. Question for you. Chronologically, was the wandering in the wilderness before or after God entered into the covenant with them? The wandering in the wilderness was after if you remember from Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses would say that God made this covenant with us at Horeb. And that goes all the way back to Exodus chapter 20 when Moses was given the Ten Commandments. He made this covenant with them then. He brought them out of the land of Egypt with a strong right hand. right, And he gave him this law at Sinai or Horeb. <clears throat> 
So now they are brought from the Sinai Peninsula and they are, they are uh, given the opportunity to go spy the land of Canaan. They spy the land of Canaan. They say, oh, we can't take it. So God says, you know what? Because you said you can't, you'll all die here in the wilderness and your children who you thought would be spoiled of these individuals who are stronger than you, I'll give them the land. So guess what they did for 40 years? They wandered the same wilderness they were already in. And then you can see in Joshua 2, Joshua takes them across. Uh, the, the first couple of chapters of Joshua, he takes them across the Jordan River into the land of Canaan. Thus the song uh, about Jordan River and entering the land of Canaan, right? So we have a wilderness wandering. They were already in a covenant relationship with God. And they did not obtain the promise because of their what? Disobedience. Now in Hebrews 3 beginning in verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Wait a minute. What now? Take heed, brethren. What does that mean? You know what it means. Take heed, brethren. He's talking to Christians. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Can anyone in this building depart from the building if you weren't currently in it? Pretty simple. The answer is no. Could any of these covenant folk have departed from God if they were never with God in the first place? You know the answer, and it's not that difficult. Verse 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today. I looked at this verse the other day, and I think this is one of the most profound verses in all of Scripture, and maybe we just don't give it the, the justice that it deserves. You know what Paul, uh, excuse me, you know what Peter would say in 2 Peter chapter 3? In verse 16, he would mention Paul's writings that are difficult to be understood, right? And in verse 17, he says, Take heed, lest ye therefore you also fall, right, from your own steadfastness. In verse 18, he says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Hebrews writer essentially gives the same warning here. He says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. What's the antidote? But exhort one another weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly. No, no, no. Daily. Do you know that the only way you're going to get to heaven is by daily exhorting yourself with God's word and doing your best to exhort others? It's the only way you're going to go. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Oh, man, I should have done that. You know, there's a parable that God, uh, the Son of God gives called the parable of the talents. And if you recall, one man was given ten and five and one. And the man that had ten got ten more. And the one that had five got five more. And the one that had one, what did he do? He hit it. And he had zero more to give. And do you know what God says to this man? Thou wicked and unprofitable servant. You know, you could think of that talent as being 75 pounds of gold. Or you could think about the actual lesson that is being taught. What God has given you, you better use or you will lose it. You will run out of opportunities at some point. To use the blessings God has given you to glorify him and to increase his kingdom. We're going to run out one day. One day we're going to look back and say I should have used my talents more. I should have used the blessings God's given me to his glory. Now I can't. It happens to every human being that has ever lived and it will happen to you. There will be a day when it's too late. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Man, sin's tough, isn't it? Sin is deceitful. You know, I think about that sometimes. Sin isn't the monster that bursts your door down and runs in the living room, ah, hands ablazing and eyes red and furious. That's not sin. Sin is the, 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 the virus that sneaks in unseen. That because you weren't very, very steadfast and careful, sin is what sneaks up on you and all of a sudden everything's okay. Do you know that in this country, used to, certain things were frowned upon. If a person was a man and, and he thought he was a woman and dressed like a woman, rightfully he was corrected. Rightfully he was saying, man, there is something wrong with you. Not being ugly, just saying there is something up here that isn't right. You need help. This was a straightforward uh, psychiatric evaluation years ago. People did not pat him on the back and say, oh yeah, your name is Fluffy the Little Poodle when he's a, he's a grown man. They didn't say that because if somebody thinks that, there are serious problems in his head he needs help he doesn't need a pat on the back and 
and say, yeah, actually you are a poodle. That's the worst possible thing you can do. Do you know that some things were frowned upon, but because it has been accepted and promoted mainstream, they've marketed these things to such a degree as now, guess what? We're the weirdos who actually speak up now. We're the weirdos who say, man, you're not a poodle. Have you lost your mind? We're the bad guys. Do you see how marketing works? It works, doesn't it? Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the, what now? Deceitfulness of sin. Brethren, I'm going to tell you something. The last, uh, the last little while, I have been trying to make a mantra in my mind. Every day I wake up and every day I repeat these ideas in my mind. And Hebrews 3.13 is part of it. I better exhort myself today on God's inspired word, lest I be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. If you don't think it can happen to you, it's already happened. Verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For some who heard did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. And with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not them that sinned and their carcasses fell in the wilderness? Who is that now? Covenant people. And they died in the wilderness and they never received the promise. Question, the folks that were in God's covenant... From Sinai, Exodus chapter 20, they were given this law and they were given promises. I will give you a land flowing with milk and honey, he said. Did those who wandered in the wilderness, did they step foot in the land or didn't they? The answer is no, they did not. Why? Because of unbelief, he says in verse number 18. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now I want you to notice verses 16, 17, and 18 of Hebrews 3. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all, the, uh, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. They did what now? They provoked. Verse 17. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that sinned? And their carcasses fell in the wilderness? In verse 18. So we see that they could not enter in because of what now? Unbelief. Do you see that Hebrews 3 is a very emphatic declaration of the possibility of apostasy? And he uses an historical example. The nation of Israel, they apostatized. You can too. If that's not the argument of Hebrews 3, I would like for somebody to show me the argument of Hebrews 3. Verse 19, so they see uh, that they could not enter in, uh, enter in because of unbelief. All right, let's keep going. What about Hebrews chapter 8? The example of the rebellious nation of Israel is proof positive. That being in a covenant relationship with God is not a one and done thing. It is not once for all without any conditions. There are absolutely conditions set forth by God. Now I'm going to take you to a different chapter in the book of Hebrews. I'm going to take you to chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. You remember what Hebrews chapter 8 is about? A new and better covenant. Remember? He quotes Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 verbatim. <clears throat> And he would say, beginning in verse number 7, For this is, uh, excuse me, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Listen to verse 8. For finding fault with it or them. For finding fault with them. Who are the them? The ones mentioned in chapter 3. The nation of Israel. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they continued not in, so I regarded them not, saith the Lord. What did you just say? Which covenant they did what now? Continued not in, and what was God's reaction? So I regarded them not. Isn't that the very definition of falling from grace? Isn't that the very example we have of being in a covenant relationship with God and then because of your actions or inactions, you now remove yourself from His fellowship? That is exactly what it means. And that isn't a, oh, it's only taught in one place. No, this is a universal principle. It's taught in every example that we have. We see all of these examples of falling away because of man's disobedience to God's will. Now I want to show you the most powerful example, I believe, 
of the uh, possibility of apostasy. If you will, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. All right. Everybody knows who Peter is. Right. Peter was not the first pope, by the way. But Peter was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Peter was the one in Matthew chapter 16 who acknowledged the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus would say, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this unto thee. In other words, you didn't come about this from your own wisdom, but it was revealed by his Father through the inspiration given to Christ and the confirmation, Acts 2 and verse 22. And it's upon that rock that Christ will build his church. The, the acknowledgement of the truth that he is the Son of God. Right? The same Peter. Peter is the same one in Acts chapter 2 that preached, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, isn't he? He's the same one that preached it in Acts 3. Repent ye and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that may come times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Same one that healed the blind man in, in Acts 3. Same one that was part of the, uh, the miraculous uh, uh, show of Acts 5, right? The death of Ananias and Sapphira. Peter's the same one that would go in Acts 10 and preach to the Gentiles all chronologically before the events of Galatians 2. When Paul would write this, he would speak of that which comes from James. And you can see that uh, Peter allowed himself to be caught up in this. Peter was a Jew. And Peter's primary audience usually was to the Jews, right? He had the gospel of the circumcision. Paul was primarily a, a, a preacher or an apostle to the Gentiles. That didn't mean that they didn't go to both because they did. But that was their primary purpose. And Peter allowed himself to get caught up in something. And he wanted to get away from the Gentiles. And he wanted to not have anything to do with them at all. It says in the text that he dissembled from them. That is, he, he removed himself from the, their presence and their fellowship. And he did it to such a degree as that Barnabas even was carried away in this. This is a grievous sin. This is essentially what happened during the, the period of, of America's dark history regarding uh, the, the colonial slave trade that we partook in. That's not, by the way, that's not the only slave trade that's ever taken place. There's still a slave trade right now. But this is the most popular one, right? And it was wrong, wasn't it? I don't think there's a decent human being on this planet that would say that it was absolutely wrong to steal someone and to put them into subjection and slavery. That is wrong. And it was always wrong and it will always be wrong. And no, the Bible does not advocate slavery. It, ad it advocates the opposite of slavery. But what we have here is that Peter is essentially being a racist. So Paul confronts him in Galatians 2 and verse 11 it says, But when Cephas came to Antioch, I resisted him to the face because he stood condemned. Now I'm, I'm reading from you from the American Standard Version. The King James says he was to be blamed. This is a word that is used in 1 John uh, dealing with the heart. If the heart doesn't condemn us, God is greater than our heart. Same word in the Greek. The King James used this one time to say to be blamed because the King James essentially was translated as, as originally a, a Catholic Bible. So of course they're going to paint Peter in the best light possible and use uh, words that maybe aren't quite as harsh. But the, the American Standard conveys it in a proper way. Peter stood condemned. Now this is the same Peter that preached the gospel in Acts 2. This is the same Peter that John 15, 3 says, You are clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. Was Peter in a saved state before this? If so, is Peter in a saved state at the point of his condemnation? No, he's not. Verse 12, For before that certain came of James, he ate with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that even Barnabas was carried away with this dissimulation. And when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Question. Is walking not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, is that sinful? Absolutely. That's why he stood condemned. So the question is, was Peter in a saved state before he was uh, practicing racism? And how did he stand when he practiced racism? He was saved up to that point, right? And this was a sin that he stood condemned. Had Peter died at that moment, what would have happened? Same thing that would happen to anybody else that's standing condemned. So if it is the case that Peter was once saved 
but fell from that position, then it is a case that you can fall from grace. If not, why not? All right, let's stop right there. End with that thought. And then we'll catch up there next week. I'd like to extend the invitation to any this morning who have never obeyed the gospel. Please listen. The Bible says that in order to be in the right relationship with God, in order to be forgiven of our sins, in order to be reconciled to Him, we must do something. That is, we must hear the Word of God. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing God's Word. God's Word would teach us, Ephesians 4, 20, we must do some things. We must repent of our sins. Repentance is a change in mind, a change in will that leads to reformed life. Matthew 21, verses 28, 29. We must acknowledge our faith in Christ, Romans 10 and verse 10. And we must be baptized for the remission of our sins, Acts 2, 38, 22, 16. And upon being baptized into Christ, Romans 6, we are baptized into his death and we benefit from his death and the blessings thereof. Being forgiven of all trespasses, Colossians 2, 10 through 13. We must now walk in the newness of life, walk in harmony with his will, 1 John 1, 6 through 10. For those who have obeyed the gospel, what if you've stepped out of the light? Come back. Repent. Acknowledge your sin and prayer to God. He'll forgive you. If you need our prayers, we'll pray for you. 1 John 5, 16. We're going to sing an invitation song. If any have need, the invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand and sing.